uh, or be part of the recording. As far as the video, they can turn their video off, but I think it's nice to see someone's face. This whole session is, is, is meant to be a guide, so uh, it's just to help people to begin to understand uh, the subject of well-being. Um, and then what we're going to try and do for the first time, which we're probably going to mess it up, is we're going to try and do some surveys, but the surveys are going to be private. So if we ask any survey questions and you feel compelled to answer, if you can send me just a private message so no one else will see that with the answer just yes or no, because what would be nice then is to share that not the individual results, but generally how people are feeling. Um, I'll also be grateful people turn their mics off uh, when the, uh, our panel is speaking. And that leads me on to the panel. Uh, and, and firstly, I'd like to introduce uh, Steve. Uh, Steve is a renowned authority speaker, commentator, and mentor on employee well-being to achieve results. He's a founding member of the Global Movement for Mental Health Support in the automotive industry, known as MenAble. He's on a mission to remove mental health stigma that exists often in male-dominated environments, uh, performance-driven businesses. And we'll come on to Steve in a moment. And then I'm pleased to say the other part of our expert on the panel was Yugita. And Yugita is an experienced business and personal coach. He's a founder of Melview Coaching and Consultancy, a professional qualified associated coach with the International Coaching Federation with over 30 years of leadership experience within a healthcare and well-being based environment. Yugita is a holistic approach that's renowned to help you reach your potential both personally and professionally. As a trained mental health first aider, Tilt 365 practitioner, Yugita's coaching style is said to be like going on a deep dive of self-discovery. So first of all, thank you very much for our two panelists. And what I'd like to do first is uh, hand over to Steve. The other thing I would say, if anyone's got any questions, um, we'll, there will be a question and answer session uh, after the two presentations. Or if you would prefer, you can send a question via the, the chat box. So uh, Steve, over to you. Thanks, Andy. Well, and thank you for that uh, excellent introduction. Uh, Based on that, I could have written that myself, if I'm honest. <laughs> so uh, bear with me. I'm just trying to uh, master the technology of getting this uh, slide. There we go. OK. Yeah. So as Andy said, um, thank you very much for inviting me to take part. I'm Steve Whitten. Uh, I am the founder of what's rapidly become the global movement for mental health support uh, in the automotive industry. Uh, it's an industry that I've been involved in and worked in for 35 years. And uh, lots and lots of experience of doing different things and different jobs uh, and so on. And uh, a good part of that actually was in and around the financial services part of the industry. So I'm fairly well versed in credit management, uh, actually, from a perspective of the whole kind of lending money to buy cars, lending dealers money to be able to stock cars and make fantastic buildings and so on. So there's a decent amount of experience on that side of things as well. Uh, probably like many other people, uh, the pandemic last year really kind of uh, caused the, the lid to come off a number of issues. And uh, I only have about 15 minutes or so to, to share some stuff with you. So I won't go into the full story uh, around that, but suffice to say, um, last year probably could be described as a very reflective year and I know that I'm not alone when I say that and what we know is that actually not just because of the pandemic but I think that's really created an opportunity for, for people to open up and start talking about stuff um, but suicide is sadly at a 30-year high um, and yet bizarrely life is arguably and conceivably better than ever. We've got more at our disposal, we've got more technology, uh, we've got more opportunity around us. So why is that? And certainly this is very true for me, very personal real experience happened to me um, during the course of last year. The lid very much came off, uh, the bubble burst and, and so on. And uh, there's other stuff that I could share with you at some point that uh, relates back to, to what that did for me. And what it really made me realize, made me feel, was that I'm not the only person of a certain age who's reached a, a point in my career where I was actually feeling, if I'm honest, a bit hopeless. Uh, I was quite depressed. I was feeling very alone and very empty. And all of that was really quite overwhelming and I had no sense of purpose. Yet to the outside world, it looked very different because 
been in the automotive industry, I'm driving a nice car and I'm doing all the glamorous stuff and going all over the place. And, um, you know, to the outside world, I was ticking all the boxes of everything being um, successful and so on. But it's this no sense of purpose bit that I want to really kind of emphasize today as part of what we're talking about around the roadmap of getting businesses and individuals back into uh, a frame of mind sort of ready for the workplace. So where I got to was on the road of the journey that I was on, um, when the lid came off and the bubble burst and all the, that, those other analogies, I got to a point, I have to say, and again, it's been fairly well sort of talked about now that I faced a situation where um, I had two paths to follow. One was the path of despair and one was the path of hope. And both of those reached the same destination. The path of despair arguably reaches that destination a bit quicker and is controllable by yourself, of course, if that's what you uh, end up doing or whatever. And I certainly, uh, even though I sit here now and presenting to you in a you know, fairly well, well rehearsed and well practiced way of, of projecting myself as somebody who's kind of calm and okay with everything, there was an awful lot of stuff that was completely opposite to that. And I, you know, I hope maybe some of that resonates, but I hope that you've not had too much that's taken you that way. Um, but what Menable is all about is recognizing that actually across many industries, people are and have been feeling that way for some time and, and emotions and feelings have been suppressed. And what we have to try and do is to work with individuals to give them a sense of hope and so that they don't follow that, that path of despair that, that could so easily happen for a number of people. So what it really made me realize as somebody who's been in the industry a long time, and I kind of felt this a while anyway, and as I said, it's been the automotive sector, the, the, the credit management, the finance side of that. Um, you know, I've seen it from all angles within finance companies, car dealers, and so on. But What's at the core of all of this for organizations is a sense of purpose and genuinely is around purpose. You know, are we putting people before processes, before profit, before performance? And what I can say is that there is definitely a huge amount of work to do. And what I'd ask you to do as we go through this is to consider uh, exactly what that means for you. And I've got a little activity to do a little bit towards the end where you can just quickly note down some thoughts for you and get a, a quick snapshot of where you are in terms of, of that within your own organization. So um, just before we get all spiritual and deep and philosophical, I have to say that the thing that joined me on this road of hope is understanding that, that love is the power. And I know that each one of you will take a very different uh, sort of uh, interpretation of what I'm talking about there. And as I said, this is not about getting deep and spiritual and emotional and so on. But it genuinely is, um, for me, that's how it, it works. And lots of conversations that I've had is, is genuinely about what we need to try and engender uh, with each other. And what I'm talking about there is a love of life a love of, of nature, you know, if you've had, like me, if you had the chance to get out and about and walk a lot and get a lot of exercise, you know, just connecting with nature and so on. A love for each other, you know, um, come back I'm into fine. this environment today. And, you know, it's nice to be around people again. It's nice to have a chat at the coffee machine and the water machine and, and uh, you know, bump into people in the corridor. And that just emphasizes that we are sociable creatures and we need to emphasize this, this love of each other. Um, but most importantly, and the key thing that was an issue for me was a, a love of self. Uh, and I've learned through all of this that if I don't love myself, how can I expect anyone else to feel good about me or to love me as well? So that was the first kind of key part of the journey uh, that sort of happened for me and made me realize that sitting behind this thing called purpose is this love of self. Now, <clears throat> That brings me on to the other bit that really links to what we're talking about today is this love of the purpose of what the business is about. And that for me comes down to one key thing and it's communication. And it's about making sure that leaders and managers in your businesses are very well versed in communicating what the purpose of the business is. If the purpose of the business is to make somebody else rich, then let's state that purpose. 
Let's be absolutely upfront and honest about that and talk about that, you know, that that is the purpose of the business. That may actually not be very fulfilling for a number of people because even the FCA, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the FCA and have a view about them, but even the FCA have recently uh, released a speech that actually talked about purposeful businesses, businesses that serve a social purpose and give people more than just a reward and a return at the end of the day. And it's up to us as leaders to absolutely generate that love of the purpose of what this business is all about. Now, on a, on a personal level, that feeling of love actually comes from the inside. It comes from here. And there is a reason why I'm, I'm sharing that with you, because for too many people, the alternative, the opposite, is stuff that happens from the outside. Now, when we get back into the workplace, and I'm sure many of you have, have experienced this, may have done it yourself, how often do you hear phrases like, I hate it here, can't stand my job, I loathe my life, life. it's all gone to not a very good outcome, it's the same old, same old, and one day I will. And what happens there is that people are constantly cycling around this current reality of the same old, same old stuff. But what we do is, unfortunately, there is an element of us that, that tends to blame external factors, blame other people, blame stuff that's going on. Well, the news that I've got on that front is that that's not happening from the outside, that's happening from the inside. And for many people, that, that could be because there's a lack of connection to the purpose and what an organization and a business is really all about. So, even this morning, I spotted something on LinkedIn, which I wanted to share with you from Simon Bartlett. I don't know if any of you connected to him, but he actually said a lack of freedom to be creative and whether that's in work or flexibility over an employee's personal time, poor communication at all levels and letting, insert your own favorite word here, get away with being an insert your own favorite word uh, and not removing said insert your favorite word, colleague or manager fast enough. Those are the three biggest company cultural destroyers. And I have to say from a lifetime in an industry that's performance oriented, that's male dominated, and is actually very cynical and very skeptical, most of that exists because many businesses haven't done enough on the journey to making it absolutely crystal clear. What is the purpose of why we're here? Now, for the individuals, for me, this boils down to four levels of consciousness. And those levels of consciousness start with being a victim. This is where the world is working against you and everything's against you. My life would be better if it wasn't for him or her or them or this. And victim mode and controller mode, which is the opposite of that, which is where people jump in and try and fix stuff, try and resolve issues, try and sort things out. Those are very fear-based emotions fear-based levels of consciousness where we're constantly projecting our thoughts into a future that may or may not exist and we're living in fear and part of that for me what I've learned on this journey is that that happens again because we don't have a sense of purpose when you do discover that sense of purpose it then becomes quite easy to move into the next stage which is a stage of discovery and in that stage of discovery the world is full of possibilities the world is full of opportunities to do something else. Now, at this point, if you're sitting there and thinking, well, you know, my job's admin based or my job's just churning over processes, it's, it's talking to people who don't want to pay us or it's talking to people who can't pay us or whatever it might be. You can still do that from a perspective of purpose and being in discovery mode because that is actually a mindset. And that for me is what this webinar is about, is helping you as leaders and managers to understand what do I actually need to do to be in the right place to get that crystal clear for my people. Now, unfortunately, we can't provide the answers. All we can do is give you hints and tips and insights, and we'll explore some questions, I'm sure, uh, in a little while. But, uh, you know, largely, this is about coming up with this yourself and understanding, am I in discoverer mode? Because that's where I'll work out the answers. If I'm in controller or victim mode, it's all gonna come from a place of fear and I'm not gonna to get to those answers uh, effectively. 
So for me, one of the things I spotted recently was that uh, in the book called Meaning, uh, The Power of Meaning by Emily Esfahani Smith, she talks about the four pillars of meaning. And in the middle of those, the key one is purpose. And purpose is about what you give, how you serve, the why that drives you. And even if you are, you know, doing the most mundane admin tasks or you're managing a team that are processing the same stuff over and over again, you can do that with a sense of purpose, with a sense of how you're serving and the why that's driving you. And the story that I use that goes with this, and it's probably well heard from many of you, is when JFK went to NASA and um, started talking to the staff there way back in the 60s and spoke to one of the cleaners in the toilet and said, what's your role here? And this guy said to him, I'm helping to put a man on the moon, sir. And that for me is a fabulous little example of, it doesn't matter how mundane we feel our job actually is, that person had a sense of purpose. They were there for a reason, even though they were doing something many of us wouldn't consider doing. These four pillars go on to talk about a lot more and I'll leave that to you at your leisure to download that book, have a look and see for yourself what that's all about. But trust me when I say, when you have that sense of purpose, those other pillars start to open up. You get a better sense of self, you get a sense of, of belonging, you get a sense of understanding that actually my story, my narrative that I've been using, I've been telling myself for many years, isn't necessarily the right thing. But I have the ability to rewrite that and do something different with it. So here's a very quick activity. You've got 30 seconds. What I'd like you to do is grab a piece of paper and a pen, and I'd like you to quickly go around what we call our men able pie, that's a little pie chart, and just mark out of five each of those areas in your business uh, that really will give you a snapshot of your culture. So management commitment, how committed to your culture and your, your well-being are the management in your business? How well is that communicated? Is there a series of training and, and events that happen to make sure everyone's skilled? up is it included in recruitment do you say to new people we take your well-being seriously and this is what that looks like and also do you have a sense of purpose in your business so literally 30 seconds don't overthink it don't analyze it just literally put a gut feel out of five for each of those uh, quick areas and i'll just give you 30 seconds starting now <laughs> Okay, just a few seconds left. I thought you were going to do. Did it, did it, did it, did it. <laughs> I could have done actually. Yeah, that's a thought. <laughs> okay, so as you look at that now, what you'll have is a quick snapshot out of five of how you feel about your organization, in, and it will immediately highlight for you a development area. And we, we'll, we can explore it perhaps during the QA. But it could be that, you know, my money would be on perhaps many of you having scored communication lower. Maybe a sense of purpose will be the, the one that stands out that, you know, why am I actually here? What's this actually about? What are we trying to achieve? So when you do that, my message to you would be, and a few little takeaways would be, get ready for purpose and a, and a new normal. None of us were born to be a job. None of us were born to be a role. And when you recognize that stuff happens externally, you realize that you is happening internally. And there's a whole great world in that discoverer level. And when you get to purpose, you realize it's about what you give, how you serve and the why. Purpose is a key pillar in, in that whole thing about meaning. And as you become starting to be your purpose, watch out for the negatives because there will be those people in the background those naysayers who will be trying to drag you down. So if you're a manager, if you're a leader, you know, think about how you position that because the cynical skeptics will come out uh, and they'll start thinking, you know, that nothing ever changes and doesn't happen like that around here and so on. So that was a very rapid 15 minutes. I hope there's some insights and thoughts in there on uh, some stuff to give you some thoughts. Um, as you could see, I need to move around a bit because the sensor in the light didn't recognize I was moving so the light's gone off I'll sort that out in a minute thank you very much there's some contact details there it'd be great to connect with you on LinkedIn and I dare say uh, that you've probably got some some questions Andy 
Yeah, thank you, Stephen. Thank you for such a, a sharing your personal experience. And I, and I think that's important. Uh, a lot of people uh, during this time are certainly feel that uh, that's anxious, at the very least, are concerned that what the new norm will become. And it's important that uh, to recognise at some level we all feel the same. Um, I certainly have a couple of questions. The first one for me really is, uh, what can organisations do to help and encourage their colleagues to reach out for help? Or um, yeah, I mean, we're going through this at the moment with the companies we're working with, and it's it's a hundred. You know, it's easy for me to say it's about culture, but it genuinely is, and it's this culture that literally comes from the top. Um, and we've been very firm in our approach with what we're doing, and we're saying this is CEO managing director level. You know, if this is being um, delegated or fobbed off further down the business, you're losing a key part of that management commitment piece. So, you know, it needs to be a culture where it's okay to not be okay. We all look out for each other. We can all spot the signs and there's lots of ways that we can get training and development on that, but it needs to come from the top hundred percent and it needs to be a pledge and a commitment. And what I would say on the training side as well, is that for me, and maybe this is just particularly the industry I work in, this is not a training issue. This is not about putting a bunch of managers in a room, giving them a course, giving them a certificate and saying, there you go, because they'll tick the box and off they'll go, but it won't necessarily address the culture. So this, this absolutely needs to come from the top. Okay, thanks. It leads me to the next question really about senior management and how important it is for them to show vulnerability. Um, when you go and meet a lot of these companies uh, and you mentioned the guys at the top, are they, do they show vulnerability or do you have to help them to, uh, to get to that point? Uh, do you know what? I've been blown away by how, how much vulnerability they have actually shown. I mean, uh, and I think the ones that are prepared to do that are the ones who come forward and go, yeah, I may well be CEO, managing director, and I may be of a certain age, but the fact that I recognise that you know, that there are issues I've got or there are issues that I've had means that I now have empathy with people uh, around me. So I spoke to uh, somebody this morning who said he walked into one of his businesses and there was somebody there whose head was in their hands a little bit. He stopped and had a chat. And that person said it was the first year anniversary of their father's death. Now, he said that immediately triggered empathy in him because he understood what that meant, because next week is the second anniversary of his own mother's death. So, you know, immediately it's about having, having that kind of empathy. But the reason we were talking was because he spotted, he, he said, I'm not convinced that that exists in all of our managers. We don't encourage empathy. You know, we recruit for confidence, not competence, and we encourage performance and product, productivity. We don't encourage those softer, more emotional skills. Okay, brilliant. Well, thank you, Steve. And uh, I'd like now to move on to uh, uh, Yagita. So I think, Agita, you've got some slides, uh, if you can now share. I'm going to take a slightly different approach to this one. I'm going to ask some questions, uh, and then uh, Agita is going to uh, answer those questions, uh, plus uh, uh, illustrate her answers with some slides. So, And again, if anyone's got any questions, uh, please uh, put those questions in the chat room, and uh, I'll make sure we put those questions forward. Um, sorry, Andy, it's been disabled. <laughs> Oh, right. Okay. So which one are you? you <laughs> just bear with me. All best plans. Okay. We should have co-host now. Thank you. Perfect. Um, so I'm Yudita. I'm... Um, I live in Essex and I'm mum to two teenagers and um, similar to everybody else, I, I also have my own story to share and uh, again, it's very personal um, it all began about 10 years ago when a very close family member of mine um, was diagnosed with a life limiting condition and given six months to live. And I felt in a really privileged position at the time having completed my training to be able to uh, really to try and support her so that she could be um, in a better place and I found that through these tools and techniques um, that she really um, started to grow in confidence and was able to to feel like she actually wanted to live life 
which was um, which was great to see, and, th and then that really fueled my purpose to support others and became my purpose. Um, and so I coach holistically around three pillars of um, emotional, physical, and financial well-being. And well-being, of course, is key at the moment during the pandemic. Um, in our organisations, we're all returning back to work, uh, and we may be faced with lots of challenges. Um, what's that's what's that's happening and we often find that consideration needs to be given to people who maybe suffered ill health or lost friends or family or have lifestyle changes and um, they might be coming back to the office uh, and, and thinking this is perhaps inefficient or costly um, and also need to consider pet or childcare needs they may can suffer anxiety or be uh, or on the opposite hand, be completely comfortable uh, with coming back to work, but actually prefer to stay at home, work from home. All in all, this pandemic has brought significant change to our lives, uh, with many businesses and employees having to adapt to a new way of working. And, um, and when you've adapted in a certain way for more than six months, it becomes habitual. So before I go into um, the rest of it, I, I don't know, Andy, I'm just going to hold here for a second, see if you've got any questions at this stage or anything's come through. OK, there's one question that's come through. Uh, with many people working from home, is it, in your opinion, harder to spot mental well-being? And what should we be looking out for in this type of situation? So okay. I'd like to Gita first and maybe Steve, you've got a comment as well. OK, so uh, this is, this is uh, a great point, actually. Uh, and something I'm going to share in my roadmap. So I'll let Steve go first before I continue um, with, with, with my, my uh, roadmap. Um, I would say, yeah, I do, do think it's, uh, it's an added issue, the working from home thing, because people aren't getting the social interaction that's, that many absolutely crave. Um, and I think it's incumbent upon leaders and managers to check in regularly with, with their staff, with their teams, um, and, you know, we've, we've got organisations that we're working with that do things like have a, a sort of internal regular um, quiz night where they'll send everyone a, a £20 delivery voucher and, uh, you know, just, just encourage everyone to just get together and have that social interaction. So I suppose the answer to the question is yes, I do think it is an issue and, and we as leaders need to be on top of that. Thank you. All right, you get, uh... So um, I suppose in answer to that, I just, just want to bring up another question, and the question is really leads me to how important is it to have a strategy around well-being in the workplace? Um, well, well-being is directly correlated to um, to, to having um, a strategy in the organisation and having well-being completely linked together, and it's directly correlated. And according to the Office of National Statistics, and I have got. If I can go down on my here, um, you can see here that actually um, it, it's a bigger issue. So, um, product loss of productivity due to well being is huge, and, and of course, the numbers speak for themselves. So, 70 million of the 137 million lost days are due to mental health issues alone. Uh, and I can share with you that uh, as part of a 2020 survey, um, it was uh, seen as the most stressful year. And 78% of the workforce say that pandemic has negatively affected their mental health and um, this often has a big effect into other areas of their life. 85% um, say that mental health issues at work negatively affect their home life and sadly 68% would avoid talking to their manager about stress and anxiety at work and interestingly 76% believe their companies should do more to support their mental health um, and, and the reality is that mental health is the most common cause of long-term absence. So ensuring well-being for colleagues can be complex to solve and potentially, I suppose, identified um, in four kind of main areas here. Um, so I put them into segments to see if it's easy to identify. The first one being disengagement. And I suppose this is the question around how do we re-engage people? Um, the second one is just it, it is around poor health. Um, lack of community culture and low adoption rates where there is a struggle to perhaps engage with strategies in place. And if left unaddressed, of course, that then leads to high absenteeism, widespread presenteeism, 
high voluntary turnover and low productivity, which obviously cannot be ignored. And this tends to have a knock on effect in other areas as shown by the, the arrows. So um, I suppose in answer to your question, uh, Andy, I think the, the statistics speak for themselves. But the question is, I suppose, how long are businesses prepared to continue without the inclusion of wellbeing in the organisation and um, now knowing the benefits? Uh, and it might be a good idea just to share the, the roadmap at this stage, because this is just a proposed uh, roadmap purely as guide. But in fact, you may want to consider two roadmaps uh, one for individuals as well as um, one for the organisation. And I would like to, I suppose, pose a series of questions to explore. Uh, I, as I know, um, every business is, is unique and one size doesn't fit all. I suppose initially it's an opportunity to explore and identify core values and perhaps time to review and reflect, importantly, um, increase your self-awareness and establish what you want to be famous for as an organisation. And consider when was the last time you had a one-to-one -one development conversation with your employees and should well-being be included as a competency? And, and that really forms that first stage, the first part of having that conversation and who needs to have that conversation at what level. And once you have the awareness and understanding this next step is really about aligning purpose and these values to create a positive workplace culture. And most businesses have their values displayed visible to all, however, um, how many truly really follow them? And consider perhaps a timeline for activities, how long will it take? It's not uh, a race, it's a marathon. Um, and how do you plan to tie together the company goals and values as an integrated community? And then it's about evolving to deal with obstacles and really paving a smooth transition for the way forward. And potentially, we remain on autopilot daily following the same patterns or firefighting situations. And how can you really adapt new ways of working without compromising on productivity and values with an understanding that um, everyone has to take some responsibility here and it's not just one sided? Um, I suppose consider how creative your leadership is and, how, and what you want it to look like and how you reach a diverse audience and um, reflect on what has been successful in the past. Communication can be a tough one uh, to crack perhaps due to the lack of honesty in workplace relationships um, as William Schultz, the um, psychologist, has, has proven. Emotional intelligence plays a major part in collaboration and change often leads people to go back and forth in the change cycle. Understanding this, how do you then want to manage and reframe your conversations? And um, often leaders also may be unsure of the best way forward themselves. And I suppose then that leads us into support of what does support mean to you? And most importantly, for your colleagues, that this disparity can cause conflict or even apathy at work when left unidentified. And how do you plan to provide that adequate training and support offline if necessary? Again, it's, this is hugely beneficial as, as I can tell you from personal experience that businesses can re re return on investment around 4.2 to 1, something I've learned personally through coaching and assessments. For example, most importantly, celebrate small successes and start by defining what success means to you. It's actually a myth that people always work for financial benefits. And in fact, recognition is paramount. And observing this, um, I suppose we've observed this to, throughout the, the first lockdown of the pandemic, where hundreds of people then signed up to volunteer and support other people. So how will you include recognition and reward as part of your, your program timeline? And hopefully this will become a guide for you to, um, to, to really own and provide, I hope it's provided you with much better thought. Um, I'll just move on to my last one here. Uh, it, this is a tool that I personally use and I find it really effective. Um, 
where you would, uh, again, use the same timeline and the roadmap, um, score yourself out of 10 to start with, um, and really then think about where you'd like to be going forward. And then it's the conversation of how do you get there? And of course, sometimes this, this isn't easy to do alone. And it's about taking that time out to really press pause for a moment and, and really and truly reflect with your team and work cohesively. Okay, so that, that's, that's me at the end. Uh, and that's a long answer to your question. <laughs> Okay, there's a couple of questions here. Is, will the slides from both uh, presenters be available so people can digest that information uh, and uh, think about their own roadmap? So happy to share the slides, both? Yeah, 100%. Okay. Then we've got a few more other questions. Is What's the consequences of uh, a business or organisation or an individual not, at this particular time, looking at well-being? I mean, what are the consequences? What, what could happen if an organisation or you as an individual don't start to um, go down this roadmap? Maybe Steve first. Um, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, ultimately there is, um, I mean, we, we try not to use this as a, as a threat when we talk into organisations, but ultimately you can envisage a situation where somebody's well-being isn't being taken seriously uh, they're being treated almost as a, as a performance related issue. And this is why it's important that managers can distinguish between the two. Um, and I, you know, I know of stories of people that have been taken down that route and then suddenly a, a letter from a solicitor arrives saying, you know, this individual is taking you to an industrial tribunal. Um, now, having spent some time in HR, that that would be fairly scary for a big organization because that's a typical kind of 10 to five on a Friday night, you're gonna settle out of court and it's probably gonna relate in, in six figure settlements. So, you know, that, that's the ultimate scary side of it, but that shouldn't be the reason for doing this stuff. The reason for doing it should be because you genuinely are empathic and care about your individuals. Um, and I think at that lower level, if, if you don't do that, you know, it, if it doesn't demonstrate, if that's not demonstrated, it would be very easy for individuals to vote with their feet. And what you end up with is absenteeism and high staff turnover. Uh, and that's what we see a lot in, in the automotive industry, particularly. Gita, thank you, Steve. Gita, do you want to add any more to that? Just um, interested to understand um, the, the question around um, and, and explore that a little bit more in terms of. Um, you know the price. What does it cost if if, if you if it's ignored? Um, and I suppose uh, it's going back to you know understanding what is it you want to be famous for as an organisation, and reviewing that so that you can really start to embed those behaviours. And I guess the yes, you know the four the, the four areas that I shared um, would absolutely be um, the price that you pay. Okay, brilliant. I actually want to just uh, describe a scenario and, and really uh, get the views of both uh, Yagita and Steve uh, of how to manage this situation. As I understand it, and I speak to a lot of credit controllers, um, the economy is artificial. Uh, payments are okay, insolvencies are down. At the same time is when companies are asking their employees to come back to work, uh, is it, we're expecting the economy to take a, a turn for the worst, meaning insolvencies are likely to increase, payment delays, and more and more difficult conversations with clients about payments. How do you manage a situation where they associate working from home as being everything's okay, and then suddenly they come back to work, and that because of the economy, the job is a little bit more harder? How would you manage that type of situation? Steve? Yeah, I, I think um, for me that boils back down to communication and honesty. Um, and in a, a time that I spent working for a very large automotive company manufacturer with their head office in the UK, um, you know, I was in the senior leadership team and it dawned on me very early on when we were going through a period of, of challenge that the, the team would read more into what you didn't say than what you did say. And it was far more beneficial for us as a management team to sit people down and be absolutely honest with them and, you know, put the tools and techniques in 
in place for them to, you know, feel that they can move into a discoverer mode and be a little bit more in control of their destiny than, than they perhaps feel that you are. Um, and that for me is really about honesty and, and openness. And as back to culture again. Thank you. And Gita, want to add any more to that? Um, I, I suppose two things. Firstly, what does challenge mean for the individual? Um, and we all are aware of the change curve uh, and clearly that individual sits somewhere in that change curve and really to explore. Um, so what are the options? Um, and it's again about coming to a compromise that is not going to affect productivity, efficiencies. Okay, brilliant. We've got a few more questions. Um, one of the questions, if I just paraphrase that question, uh, feelings are deep. Uh, it's difficult to recognise that in this potentially virtual world. Given this idea, how can a business or an organisation um, really get to understand what someone's feelings really are in this virtual world? Yugita. So, it, yeah, absolutely right. Uh, relationships are, you know, that bit more tricky to embed online. Um, and this is about really taking ownership to touch base with the individuals on a regular basis. And one of the tips that I've pop, popped in uh, on, on my presentation is, is having a non-work conversation with somebody on a daily basis, whether, you know, pick a colleague. And I think this is about owning and doing your 50% of, of, of the, um, I suppose, relationship building uh, and, and then using that as an opportunity. Well, Steve, do you want to add any more to that? I, I would totally agree with that. And I think the, um, the key question is, and this was on the, the documentary that Roman Kemp uh, put out on the BBC a few weeks ago. Um, the question is, how are you? No, how are you? You know, it's that real kind of, don't just accept the first answer, let's dig a bit deeper and find out. And Yugita's absolutely spot on. Doing that in a virtual world is far more difficult because you don't have the face-to-face, -face, you're missing a load of the body language. Um, so it makes it even more important that leaders and managers are more tuned into that and more aware of, probably I need to ramp up the amount of interaction and the con contact that I have with my team, I think. Brilliant, another question from the, from the audience. Uh, what is the percentage split of needing to care about staff well-being and needing to be concerned about the business. So, Steve, first, please. <laughs> um, well, this is an interesting one. I'm not sure, if I may, I'm gonna, my, my immediate perception of the question was a bit similar to something somebody said to me a little while ago, which was, if you show that you care too much, people will take the proverbial. Uh, and my response to, and that may not be where the question was coming from, but my, the, my response to that was, what does it say about your culture that people have to take, uh, swing the lead or go to the doctor and get a false sick note if they, in, in order to get some space and take some time out? If they're not able to come and talk to, the, to you about that, what does it say about your culture? In answer to the question, what's the percentage split? Um, I mean, there's probably people who are far better at maths on this than I am, but the, um, you know, for me, it's 100% of both because the reality of it is positive employee outcomes equals positive customer outcomes, which equals positive business outcomes. And this is 100% about putting people before profit. And if you do that, ironically, it takes care of itself. You get that? Do you want to add any more to that? And just building on what Steve said, so yes, absolutely, um, employee uh, well-being is directly correlated to business growth, and, and I think a lot of people know that it's just exactly how much are we losing out on, what does that mean to the organisation, and um, as I shared, that uh, the, the recent survey only in 2020 showed that 78% of the workforce um, say that the pandemic has negatively affected their mental health, and, and even more so, 85% say that they, they, the issues at work have then negatively affected their home life. So, so actually, in, in that sense, the figures speak for themselves. And I think it goes back to understanding that actually from a positive perspective, when you, when you really um, start to take that culture on board, every kind of 1% in, in cu customer care, you know, I suppose uh, that increases another 4.5% as in my, you'll see on my, um, my slides as I've shared them before. And um, 
And, and so it makes no sense really not to um, include well-being as part of your business strategy going forward. Andy, can I, can I just add in as well on that? What I would also say is, as somebody who's uh, trying very hard to practice the art of diary blocking at the moment, because things are starting to get busy and I'm you know, trying to chunk things down. The other interpretation of that question of you know, what percentage goes into what is that, you know, could there be a danger that we go, oh, hang on a minute, uh, we'll, we'll allocate Tuesday to well-being because we've determined that 20% of the week needs to be about well-being. Um, you're doing it wrong in that case. You know, well-being is like coaching. It's, it should be a thread that runs through your business that you don't even notice you're doing it. And that, as I think you has uh, suggested as well, comes back to habits, culture, and the way that we interact just, just generally. Okay, we've got a few more questions. Uh, making money, paying the bills, are also drivers in having purpose. But over and above, what sort of examples have you heard of what motivates people that gives them purpose? So let's go to Yagita first. Okay. So um, I suppose when you reflect on as an organisation, um, you're, you're, when you were most successful um, and, and really consider what that felt like um, as a vision and, and what did you hear your colleagues say? How did it feel? And, and how can you really um, start to relive those moments and bring that back into the culture. Right, thank you, Steve. Could you just remind me of the essence of the question again, please? I was trying to find it in the chat. And I think we're basically saying, other than money, yeah, um, what, uh, what examples have you heard of what motivates people that gives them purpose? Um, yeah, I've got an example of an organisation that we're... Uh, sort of, how should I say, courting at the moment because we want to work with them. Um, they are a family-owned business. They actually sold a business 10 years ago um, and took many, many millions from that sale. They've invested it in another business and they've now set their purpose as the purpose of the business is to generate money in order to help the community. So they've formed foundations, they've formed uh, connections with charities, they're working with organizations like ours, uh, hopefully, and um, you know, they're, they're very, very clear. The purpose of the business is to be successful and make as much money for everyone so that we are in the position to be able to help the remainder of the community. And, and that message goes down through the business and everyone's like, wow, yeah, I really get that. Okay. Uh, two last questions, and then uh, I think we'll run out of time. Uh, paraphrasing this one, if you've got an employer that says you can only do the job by coming to the office, so in other words, you can't build a gearbox without going to the factory, how do you deal with that? How do you manage that situation where you've got this difference of opinions? Uh, we'll come to Steve on this. So Steve first. Uh... <laughs> Well, I suppose, you know, practically and realistically, there are going to be jobs that can only be done from a place of work. Um, you know, manufacturing is, is the obvious one, as is probably many aspects of healthcare and retail and so on. So um, that office based job. Well, if it's if it's an office based job, I mean, I personally would take a take a bit of a view on it, you know, because I think that's the other thing of coming back to normality is that I was talking about this with somebody this morning. You know, many people are actually quite um, anxious about going back to the office. And, you know, I think now it's about being a bit more flexible and saying, you know, perhaps you can have two days a week working from home. Then that comes down to trust. Brilliant. And you, Gita? Sorry, I can't find a question in this one. Would you mind just asking me a question? Yeah, if you've got an organisation, let's say an office organisation, that says the job can only be uh, done by coming to the office, um, and the employees are saying we'd like flexibility. How would you manage that scenario where you've got such difference of opinion as to where the job can actually be done? Yeah. And it's, it's tricky, it's not straightforward. Um, at the end of the day, yes, that you know, there, there is a business need. Um, and I, I think it's just about understanding, yes, we have worked from home for a period of time, that's become quite habitual, but actually what's the reality of the situation? And, um, you know, is there a compromise here? And what is it that's really going to work for the organization? 
And until you've really sat down and had a conversation with this individual, because you could be at loggerheads with somebody um, and, and really disagreeing, and, and they in the, inevitably, I suppose what happens is uh, the line manager will put their foot down um, and say, it, this is, this is, it's my way or no way. And actually, again, it goes back to understanding, having that one-to-one -one conversation and really understanding where the way you come to Brilliant, thank you. Uh, two last questions. Uh, do you assume when a colleague is always laughing and joking that life is good, opposed to uh, uh, and subsequently don't give them time, versus a colleague who seems to be regularly sad, would you treat them differently? So, Yagita. Again, that's perception. Um, so, we perceive things all the time and uh, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll judge people on um, appearance, uh, external factors. Um, it's a bit like my iceberg um, scenario. So if you, if you think about an iceberg, what you see on the exterior and the top of the water is the ice. Um, and obviously that's what people want you to see. So I think that's one to remember. Um, what you have got underneath the water is everything else in terms of their beliefs, their assumptions, their values. And unless you tap into that area, you won't really know. Thank you, Steve. Uh, everything you get to said, but what I would also say is that as somebody who's you know been in an industry where it's been okay for me to be the class clown for 30 years, um, what I can say from personal experience was that there was a reason why I was like that, and everyone perceived me to be happy go lucky, jazz hands presenter, host of award ceremonies, and so on and so on. The reality of it was that that was a mask that was hiding what was really going on. And what I'm saying to people now is that you really should be treating every single person differently. And as a manager and as a leader, it's your responsibility to know each member of your team inside out, um, you know, and to understand, well, how, how I treat Dave is different to how I treat Sally. Okay, we've got another question come in. Uh, if you have someone at work uh, you're worried about and you think they are suffering with mental health, but they don't seem to want to engage or talk, how do you help them? Any tips, Steve? Um, talk to them, offer support, be there to listen, uh, reassure them that they absolutely won't be judged, uh, that you won't try and fix anything. I think that's a key thing that we try and do too much is we try and fix somebody uh, and that's not what they want. Um, and, and just you know, reassure them and let them know that, that culturally it's okay. Just, just put, put it out there that it's all right for them to reach out and and hope that eventually they do. But yeah, keep a close eye if you're very, if you're concerned about somebody. Really, Gita? Um, I, I wonder if, uh, if they're not open to talking to, to you, maybe, um, is there anybody else they would talk to? Um, and again, just, you know, I suppose all you could do in that situation is comment on what you've observed um, about their whole demeanor and maybe, um, and say, look, I've noticed this about you and, uh, you know, I understand you may not want to talk to me. Uh, what can I do to support? Brilliant. Okay. Uh, if there was one key takeaway from uh, today's uh, webinar, um, what would that be? So, Yagita. So uh, for me, well-being is, is yes, it's a, a hot topic at the moment, but actually for the right reasons. Um, and I think businesses need to, you know, potentially really think about the consequences of not including well-being into their strategic plan. Since they've come back and returned to work, navigating this kind of shifting climate is, is being really tricky for organisations. And really to, to take some time and stop of where you want to, to be going uh, in terms of moving forward. Uh, and what does that look like? So absolutely, you know, and, and if, you, if you struggle with doing that alone, recruit help. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, I'd go along with that as well. And I'd say communication is key, um, as is being absolutely clear what the purpose is. And if, you know, you found yourself as, as a CEO or as an MD or a senior manager and, you know, you, you probably feel that you're suffering with a bit of imposter syndrome or maybe don't, you know, have never addressed your own lack of self-worth and all that other stuff, because we're all susceptible to this, is, as Gita says, you know, reach out, talk to someone, be open, get a coach, you know, at ever, at that works at every level. Um, and, and just communicate. The key thing to all of this is, is clear communication without an agenda as well. Just, just be honest.
Brilliant. Thank Sorry, you. Anna, can I, can I just sure. add, add to what Stevens just said? Um, and I think just, just finally for me, it's, it's recognition um, and reflecting what we thought, what I said around people volunteering in the pandemic, it's not always financial. And I think, you know, recognition goes a long way uh, for, and, and absolutely celebrating uh, and having a plan to recognise people. And how do we do that when they're virtual as well? Perfect. Okay, well, it, uh, it leads me to say we're just on time um, to thank uh, Yugita and Steve uh, for an excellent insight into uh, wellbeing. Uh, and thank you for sharing your experiences and your expertise. I think what you both have done is really highlighted more than before, certainly from my point of view, is the importance of wellbeing in any organisation. I, I think it's the right thing to do. Yeah. Uh, and I've also perhaps appreciated uh, more so than ever is the importance of honesty uh, and maybe treating individuals, uh, they've got their own challenges. So um, certainly inspires me to consider a roadmap for, for our business. Um, and, uh, and hopefully those that attended uh, have, have, have learned something uh, and uh, they're at the beginning of their own personal or company roadmap. So this is gonna be uh, on the landscape for some time. Yeah, so, uh, so we either embrace it, be part of it, um, or, you know, I think, unfortunately, there'll be consequences not doing that. So, uh, in, in, and there's also some lovely comments here saying, excellent presentation. Thank you, Gita and Steve. And of course, Andy, you've done a brilliant job. I put that word in there. Uh, of course, Andy. Okay. And everyone seemed to enjoy it. So, unless there's any more questions, I'd like to thank all those that attend on behalf of the CICM. Uh, Steve, Gita, again, thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, a copy of this video will be available and also a copy of the slides. So all be safe. Bye.